Ignition running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good evening and welcome. It's Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB, the phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Let's, let's go up to speed on the bombs. I'm using air quotes in the studio. You can't see it, but it appears that law enforcement now saying that, that most, if not all of them, were non-functional. There was a report from the New York Times late yesterday describing the bombs the pipe bombs and the people on background who had knowledge of what they look like said that they looked very much like something you would see on TV. And those aren't actually how real pipe bombs look, including having a clock uh, taped to them so that you could see how much longer was left before the bomb exploded, that normal pipe bombs aren't built that way, that these seem very much to be about scaring people as opposed to actually causing harm. Uh, now, the media wouldn't wouldn't actually treat it that way. And, and you know, I do have to say as well, um, on the bomb sent to CNN, God bless them, but this was not a bomb sent to CNN. It was a bomb sent to John Brennan, a commentator who appeared regularly on CNN before getting hired by MSNBC. Uh, it was misaddressed. It should have gone to MSNBC, not CNN. It was to an individual. And now apparently Robert De Niro, I, I've read today, uh, one came to him. Maxine Waters. And, of course, the, the press is all over itself with um, these are people who were critical of the president or the pre president was critical of him. It's all his fault. You know, I was on MSNBC earlier and, and Katie Turr did the with all due respect, sir, uh, aren't you going to condemn the president? And I've said I, I don't think it's it's helpful or useful for the president to call the press the enemy of the people. Um, I don't. I think the press does a disservice to the American people by how badly they report things, but I don't think they're our enemy. I know some of you disagree with that, um, but I don't think it's helpful as well to say that the president is to blame for this. The president was not to blame for Steve Scalise uh, being nearly killed or the other Republicans who were nearly gunned down by James Hodgkinson. The president wasn't even in office or on the campaign trail when... Floyd Lee Corkin showed up at the Family Research Council and tried to gun down everyone in those offices. Um, you know, to say that the president is responsible, look, I think he's a symptom, not a cause. And having all these reporters doing hand-wringing over the president, know it's the president's tone, uh, well, this is the guy you got. Um, deal with it. You know what you can do? You, you don't have to cover this stuff. I mean, that's part of the thing here. If the media did not cover the president doing these things, most Americans would not know. Most Americans actually aren't on Twitter. Most Americans are not engaged in social media like that. If the media didn't cover the president's rallies, guess what? No one would know. And it's it's like they want to have it both ways. They want to cover the president because they want the ratings draw that comes, and then they want to be outraged about it. Well, if you're outraged about it all the time, stop covering it, and it goes away. I mean, this is the these are the media outlets that covered the landing of the president's plane when he was a candidate, the Trump plane, as if it was Air Force One. They gave him wall to wall coverage. It was a symbiotic relationship. Donald Trump benefited. He got something like five billion dollars in free media time from the American media through the course of the campaign, more than any other candidate, including Hillary Clinton. He becomes the president. And now they're outraged by the guy. Well, they're the ones who helped create the president by giving him so much attention. And now they want to complain. It's just nonsense. By the way, I want to let you guys know that I'm I'm going to actually not cover raw news uh, at the top of the next hour. What I want to do is walk you through the constitutional amendments. So if you're curious about the constitutional amendments, we'll actually spend time in the next hour walking through each of them uh, and take phone calls 404 872 1-800-WSB-TALK. Uh, right now, though, I want to pivot from the bombs, the fake bombs that now appears, to the border. General or General Secretary Mattis is ordering 800 soldiers to the border. He's ordering them to the border to secure the border and help deal with this caravan that is coming. It's amazing how these, these fake bombs have thrown 
coverage of the caravan out of the news just as polling was beginning to show that it was having a negative impact on uh, Democratic turnout and a positive impact on Republican turnout. Or I shouldn't say it wasn't suppressing Democrats so much as over-amplifying Republican turnout, um, people who were sitting on the sidelines. And it does appear to be having an effect on Republican voters turning out. It is a big issue. Even legal Hispanic voters, citizen voters who are Hispanic in this country, are opposed to the caravan. And Democrats more and more are grumbling about it. Now, the odds are still that Democrats take back the House of Representatives. That's not a sure thing. It is possible for Republicans to keep the House. It's just not probable. Um, The reason is, let me put this in perspective for you as to why it is not probable, but is possible. Given the number of seats out there. Republicans essentially need to win four out of every five toss-up seats. Democrats only need to win one out of every five toss-up seats. That, that's that's a pretty big deal. I guess actually I, I take that back. I did the math wrong. Republicans need to win um, four. Uh, yeah, Republicans need to win four out of five. Democrats need to win two out of five, basically. Um So, yes, yeah, that's right. Republicans need to win four out of five. Democrats need to win two out of five. And the odds are for the Democrats. They have an easier hill to climb. That doesn't mean they're going to be able to do it. And it's things like this uh, caravan that make it harder for the Democrats. Consider Will Hurd in Texas. Will Hurd is a Republican congressman in Texas. His district went for Hillary Clinton. He is winning. Will Hurd is winning because he established his own brand before President Trump and did not get his brand muddied by President Trump. And on top of that, his voters, many of whom support Hillary Clinton, a majority of whom support Hillary Clinton, support him on this border issue. He's taking a a firm stance on the border issue. He is soft on immigration. He is very much in favor of amnesty and and weaker immigration than the president, but he's taking a very firm stand on we as a sovereign nation need to be able to secure our border, and that's working with him with these voters. And that's problematic for Democrats. Then you have the situation in Tennessee. Democrats thought they may be able to pick up Bob Corker's seat in Tennessee uh, with Phil Bredesen, their former last Democrat governor of Tennessee, And now Bredesen has come out and said this convoy is no big deal. People should ignore it. Marsha Blackburn is playing this up in the last two weeks of the campaign. That is a negative issue in Tennessee. Why? I've seen the polling in Tennessee. Immigration among independent and Republican voters in Tennessee is the number one issue. A state that is not even close to the border. It is the number one issue. This isn't going to go over well in a place like that. Uh, Republicans taking a hard line stand on this caravan is helping them. In Missouri, Claire McCaskill is floundering. Black Democrats, I did not, not realize this until the last week or so, talking to friends of mine in Missouri. Black Democrats in Missouri have always been very suspicious of Claire McCaskill. And one of the reasons is because during redistricting in 2010, Republicans were more accommodating to black Democrats keeping their districts than the Democrats were. And Claire McCaskill sided with the Democratic leadership in the state against black Democrats. They have not liked her since then. She's running her closing ad in Missouri, and it's Claire's not one of those crazy Democrats. Well, black Democrats in Missouri are taking offense at this, thinking she's talking about them. And there is some suggestion out there that black Democrats in Missouri may actually be encouraging black voters to vote for Josh Hawley, the Republican attorney general, who they've had a good working relationship with because they don't like Claire McCaskill. That's why Nate Silver over at 538, he puts the Democrats chance at 85 percent taking back the uh, House of Representatives, uh, but only a 17 percent chance of taking back the Senate. Uh, Heidi Heitkamp, we know, is toast. Uh, Claire McCaskill looks like she's toast. Looks like Martha McSally's going to win in Arizona. And Joe Donnelly now may be hurting in, in Indiana. The, the votes show that race tied, which no one expected. Do you have trouble sleeping? Do you struggle putting your kids to bed each night? When you sleep poorly, how does this impact the rest of your day? Look, I'm excited to announce I'm partnering with Calm. It's the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. It was named App of the Year last year by Apple. And if you head to calm.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, 
you'll get 25% off a Calm Premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of premium programming, including sleep stories, which are bedtime tales for grown-ups designed to quiet your mind and relax your body. They're read by soothing narrators like Clark Peters from The Wire and Jerome Flynn from Game of Thrones. There are guided meditations on topics like anxiety, stress, and sleep, and there's soothing music and more. Now look, for a limited time, the Eric Erickson Show listeners get 25% off Calm Premium subscriptions at calm.com slash Eric. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. It includes unlimited access to all of Calm's amazing content that's going to get you drifting off to dreamland in no time. Get started today at calm.com slash Eric. Then go to sleep. You know, listen, okay. Um, at the top of the hour, as I have said, I want to walk you through the ballot, uh, the amendments. There are five amendments. Uh, the fourth one has gotten all the attention. That is the victim's rights law. Marcy's law, I believe they call it. I'm voting against it. You're not going to hurt my feelings if you vote for it. It's just already law in Georgia. I see no reason to put it in the Constitution when it's already law. Um, The others I got other issues with. Um, We'll get into that at the top of the hour. Uh, Additionally, Megyn Kelly is getting paid $69 million to leave uh, NBC. And I got some thoughts on that. I will save them for you in the next hour. I do want to move on to Georgia politics And the governor's race, the judge has said that the secretary of state's office can't just discard ballots. They've got to, if there's a signature match issue, you know, it doesn't seem to me that the Abrams campaign really wants to win the election so much as they want to have a grievance about the election process for her future. And I'm starting to wonder if she went into this campaign realizing she wasn't actually going to win governor But she was going to try to amplify voting rights issues and make that her reason for being after she loses. Absentee voting in Georgia is actually the most complicated process. You have to fill out a form. Your information has to match. They mail you your absentee ballot. You have to fill it out, and then you have to fill out the form on top of it. Then you have to sign it. Your signature has to match your voter registration card. Then you have to mail it back. and It's the most complicated process. Why do you go through the process of trying to get your voters to vote in the most complicated process as opposed to just driving them to early voting or driving them on Election Day? That's not a winning strategy for a campaign. Uh, Republicans tend to do absentee voting, but the absentee voting process that Republicans do is much more organic. It's not this organized effort with campaigns being involved, contrary to what the media tells you all the time. Uh, And besides, most Republicans vote on Election Day. They don't vote with early voting. Um, I, I don't know why you do something like this as your strategy for winning when banking on absentee voting. I mean, particularly, my goodness, look at the number of people who couldn't fill out the voter registration form that our campaign turned in. You want a bunch of people who can't fill out a voter registration form to try to fill out an absentee ballot application and form, which is even more complicated? That doesn't seem wise to me. But I think it's part of a larger strategy. And I want to talk about that when we come back. I've also got some early voting numbers I will share with you. Welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. A couple of things. Uh, I talked to some folks who are on the campaign trail, and they're pointing out a pattern. And so I don't mean this to be disrespectful. I really don't, but I've been in this game for a long time now. I mean, I got into politics in 1994 when I was a college student. I I worked with reporters. I sent out press releases. I helped shape stories. I got into law school. I became an elections attorney. I became a campaign strategist. I managed campaigns. I consulted on campaigns. I designed campaigns. Uh, I worked at Red State, uh, The Resurgent, CNN, and Fox. Reporters are lazy, by and large. There are some really good reporters out there, but a lot of reporters are lazy. And most reporters, even the good ones, don't understand election law. They just don't. And there is so much bad reporting out there about the election, absentee balloting, voter uh, voters being removed from the voter rolls, pending voters, all of that. You can tell that these stories are being spoon fed 
to sympathetic reporters who probably have a liberal bias, both locally and nationally. Because look at the pattern that we're seeing right now. The first story was that Brian Kemp put 53,000 people on pending voter rolls, and most of them were black voters. It turns out 75% of those voters didn't put down an accurate Social Security number, and 23% of those voters had been there since on the pending voter file since 2013 or 2014, and they came from Stacey Abrams' group, a New Georgia project, which messed up the Social Security numbers. The second story is that Brian Kemp removed 300,000 voters from the rolls. Never mind that this happens in every odd-numbered year. Never mind that these are voters who hadn't voted in seven years. Never mind that the Secretary of State had tried to find these voters, couldn't find those voters, and still had to wait four years to remove them from the rolls. It's just a drip, 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 drip process of trying to build the stories. So what is the latest story? Well, we moved into absentee balloting. See, see the process of the stories? This is how you can see that there's a political campaign involved in shaping the stories. First, it was about registered voters. Then it was about pending voters. Then it became about the absentee absentee voting process. Then it became about the early voting process. And now it's about the actual voting machines that people are calling reporters claiming the machines are changing their votes. There's no evidence of this. You do need to understand all of the reporters who are saying that the votes are being changed on these machines. They've got no evidence. There is no proof. And I don't think it's possible. But what you're seeing is a manufactured grievance process in this story. Uh, Essentially, it's the Abrams campaign building the story that the race is being stolen from her. And again, I will say, as I said the other day, if you're a voter listening to this and you hear the Abrams campaign essentially saying it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to steal it anyway. Well, then why are you going to show up? Which leads me to my larger point. You would not be screaming about the rules being broken if you were winning. But every time the rules don't work out for the Democrats, they scream about the rules and say the deck is stacked against them because of the rules or somebody's cheating. Stacey Abrams would not be out there running a campaign saying Republicans are cheating if she thought she was winning. She would be making it about the issue. Instead, she's trying to build an issue to justify her for her donors after spending all of this time on voting reform in Georgia and getting people registered to vote. Why did you lose? Well, it's got to be that they cheated. They stole the election. That's going to be her excuse. It has nothing to do with the truth of the matter asserted. It has everything to do with she needs an excuse to her donors. Again, if you are running a successful campaign for governor in Georgia, you're not out there trying to get people to phone the media and say the machines are changing my vote when they're not. You're not out there trying to get the media to say, oh, Brian Kemp is throwing people off the rolls and stealing the election when he's not. That's what you do when you're losing. Oh, I've got a juicy story for y'all and kudos to, I, I'm going to try it. Jessica Salai at uh, All on Georgia has, she got the scoop the other day about Lucy McBath uh, living out of Georgia, having um, been in Tennessee and her husband being in Tennessee. She's got one here. Listen to this. Information combi- compiled from Stacey Abrams' social media accounts and various news outlets cross reference to Stacey Abrams' per diem account schedule indicates Stacey Abrams on numerous occasions collected state reimbursements for activities on days without state business. The comparison encompasses the six years she was minority leader. While Abrams served as minority leader, it was expected that she would be among the top recipients of per diem days, as reported by the AJC. But the question is whether or not those per diem days were related to her official capacity for the state of Georgia. The September article in the AJC says Abrams began collecting daily payments from the state at almost twice the rate of her predecessor. But some of the events attended while collecting per diem reimbursements include Democratic Party events, Hillary Clinton speeches, and so-called resistance events in 2014, which would not qualify as state business, and they total more than $11,500 in reimbursements. Wow. Wow. In 2011, Stacey Abrams collected 155 days of per diem. In 2014, questionable events in her per diem include an Atlanta Dream Game addressing Emily's List, the progressive group, speaking engagements with lobbying and advocacy organizations, and tours of the port that were used politically. Uh, Ten days are in question for a total of $1,730. In 2015, there's only one per diem day in question. The per diem would be 173 
uh, plus any mileage. In 2016, Abrams collected per diem days for trips to San Francisco to visit political PACs, attend lobbying dinners in Savannah, hit the campaign trail with other Democrats, listen to Hillary Clinton speak at Planned Parenthood in D.C., speeches she gave at Yale, and appearing on CNBC for a total of $2,422. In 2017, Abrams took per diem days to attend at least three resist town halls, speak at a rally on health care, claim an honorary doctorate degree, and speak at a commencement ceremony at the Atlanta Rotary Club. Sounds like she needs to reimburse the state. This, uh, it, it, all, what this means is that Stacey Abrams was billing taxpayers for her going to political campaign events, which is not the purpose of per diem, and there probably should be an investigation into this. Um, that just, that smells fishy. Uh, it's amazing that a political blog has been able to find this, a uh, hat tip to Jessica, and it's been ignored by the media. Have you guys heard about this? I, I, this is just baffling to me. WSB TV is running the story um, about a Georgia mother. Her toddler went to bed sick and woke up paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, two young patients were treated at Scottish Rite after they fell ill and woke up partially paralyzed. Doctors are still working to figure out what causes acute flaccid myelitis, or AFM. And the condition is rare, similar to polio. It causes muscle weakness or partial paralysis. It appears to be caused by a virus, but they don't know which virus. That was the case for two-year-old Abigail. Her mother said one moment she was a healthy child who came down with a double ear infection and fever. Next day, she woke up paralyzed from the neck down. Um, This is 62 confirmed cases of AFM in 22 states, 93 possible cases. Five cases in Georgia in 2016. And there's still a lot that people don't know. It's just, it, it's one of those things where modern medicine has advanced so much, but there's so much we still don't know. And I am, I'm really concerned. Y'all, I, I don't know how I approach this subject because I will offend so many of my friends. But yeah, I'm assuming if you're in a church somewhere in Georgia, there are oilers in your church. That is women who use essential oils. My, my wife uses essential oils for a lot of things. And we've had this conversation. Uh, and she has friends who believe they cure all, um, can cure cancer, can cure anything that ails you. Uh, we had a friend who um, just, it's kids get sick and they want to give them oils. And I, I'm a big fan of modern medicine. And I, So many people are skeptical of modern medicine, and I understand the skepticism, and a lot of that skepticism is born of things you you don't understand, and there are a lot of people who have decided that, well, there would be a cure for cancer, except uh, pharmaceutical companies don't get rich off of curing things, which I think is a garbage argument, but it's an argument I've had friends of mine make to me with a straight face in dealing with my wife's situation, that this pill that she takes on a daily basis keeps her cancer from growing, and that there are people who are convinced that this cancer would be cured, but doctors they would we wouldn't keep buying the pill, so they got it. And that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. But so many Americans now believe in conspiracy theories. And listen, I, I don't want to dismiss oils. Um, we use them in my house with my kids, particularly for breathing. Um, I'm I'm a fan of some homeopathic treatments. I know of someone who had a terrible illness and was on the verge of death, and it was actually acupuncture that saved his life of all things, and the older doctors were willing to believe it. The younger doctors were not. There are some things we don't understand, but some some of what uh, the CDC and others have been saying about this disease and, and not about the Georgia situation. There's a, a pool of people in Los Angeles, and they're wondering if this came from people who didn't want to get their kids vaccinated. The, this whole anti-medicine wave, it's like we're headed into the dark ages by choice this time. We graduated out of it, and people are now so skeptical and so conspiratorial about everything. i got to tell you, I don't believe conspiracy theories because nobody in this world can keep a secret anymore. And if there was an elaborate conspiracy to keep cancer from being cured, I think we would know about it because someone would open their mouth and, and say so. And the only people who seem to say it right now are cranks on YouTube with a with a YouTube channel who've never actually done anything in life. I just say the, the conspiratorial stuff. I think, and it overshadows the these terrible, life-threatening situations. These poor families whose kids are getting paralyzed by this virus. The CDC knows so little about it, and they're doing the best they can to find out about it. And the conspiracy theorists, I think, just 
uh, slander the good work of the CDC and doctors who are really trying to save lives. It's frustrating. Uh, prayers for these people and these ch- children who are going through this. And God bless the doctors in modern medicine for trying to find something. When we come back, we're going to talk about the amendments. We're going to break those down. One, two, three, four, five. Those amendments, what they mean, whether you should vote for them or not. I'm voting against all of them. I'll tell you why. Welcome back. It's Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. I want to spend just a few minutes this evening uh, actually talking about the amendments because I've gotten a lot of questions. I've told you all I'm voting no on all of them, but a lot of people have wanted to know what exactly they are. Uh, So let me review these amendments. Now, there are some statewide referenda uh, that have been proposed. I'm not going to touch on those necessarily. I definitely want to talk about these amendments. The amendments would be binding and would change the Constitution in Georgia. The very first amendment you're going to be presented with, Amendment 1, says it creates the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund to protect water quality, wildlife habitat, and parks. So what would this do? Well, it would take 80% of the sales tax that's already collected at sporting goods stores like Academy, Dick's, Hibbets, you name it, uh, and would reserve that money for this fund, uh, the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund. It would not raise taxes. What it would do is it would take the existing sales tax that is generated from sporting goods stores and place it into a trust fund. That trust fund would be used to conserve lands that protect drinking water sources, water quality of rivers, lakes, and streams, conserve forests, fish, wildlife habitats, and state and local parks. And, of course, it's for the children. It would provide opportunities for our children and families to play and enjoy the outdoors. I Why? Um, essentially what you're doing is you're taking 80% of sales tax revenue from sporting goods stores and reserving it for this fund, depriving the general fund of this money, which ultimately means you're depriving other things of money that you don't necessarily need here. There are other ways to fund parks and these sources. I mean, for example, there are already conservation easements. There are already fees to get into Georgia state parks. I, I don't think this is necessary. And all it's going to do is deprive other resources of money and create a slush fund here that you and I both know are going to be abused by legislators and bureaucrats. I don't think this is necessary, however good the intention is for something like this. Uh, The second amendment you will um, confront is one I'm vehemently opposed to, and I have a lot of friends who support it. Uh, You should see my text messages in the last week over this Second Amendment. Uh, The Second Amendment creates a statewide business court, and it claims to lower costs, enhance efficiency, and promote predictable judicial outcomes. Now, what happens here in Georgia, we have municipal courts, we have state courts, we have superior courts, we have a court of appeals, and we have a Supreme Court. And what this would do was create a whole new branch within ju- the judiciary, a state business court. And business disputes that are considered complex would go to this court. And the reason they want to do it is basically because they think juries are dumb. Um, and we they want essentially to have special courts with experts decide business issues. My problem with this amendment is that it creates a whole new bureaucracy. We would create new judges. They would need new space that would drive up costs as well. Um, This is supposedly to lower costs. It's going to increase costs. And frankly, if you're worried about a jury not being smart enough to handle this, well, then we've got bigger problems in the state. Uh, We have a court of appeals and we have a Supreme Court already that uh, issue opinions that direct superior courts how to steer these cases. Superior courts need to be able to make the law understandable to an average citizen 
what we are essentially saying with this amendment is that we have now created a branch of law, business law, that only experts in business can navigate, that slowly but surely over time will make business law more and more difficult for your average small businessman to understand. And instead of having to go to a jury of peers, if there's a small business issue, ultimately you're going to go to some experts who are going to railroad small businesses. Yes, I know the Chamber of Commerce doesn't talk about it like that. The legislators who supported it don't talk about it like that. But I think ultimately that's what happens. You create an entire new bureaucracy, an entire new judicial structure, an entire new branch within the judiciary, and then you complicate laws that ultimately only experts can deal with and the costs are ultimately going to go up, not go down. Anytime you have a constitutional amendment like this promising to lower costs, run the other way. The Third Amendment is to encourage the conservation, sustainability, and longevity of Georgia's working forests through tax subclassification and grants. Now, what on earth would this do? Okay, so there are tax classifications in Georgia, meaning certain things get taxed certain ways. Uh, let me read through this. Uh, one of the things this leg- amendment would do is provide that assistance grants related to forest land conservation use property may be increased by general law for a five-year period and that up to 5% of assistance grants may be deducted and retained by the state revenue commissioner to provide for certain state administrative costs and to provide for the subclassification of qualified timber property for ad valorem taxation purposes. Now, what does all of that mean? That's part of my problem here. No one's going to understand what this means. Number two, I'm fairly confident this can be done with state law without having to amend the Constitution. And number three, they should have done a better job in describing this for people. Uh, Additionally, I'm a little bit concerned with treating timberland property for ad valorem tax purposes different from other property. Uh, which this would do. I realize there are some uh, benefits to the grants, but essentially you've got the um, you've got the business grant in the amendment number two. You've got the farmer grant in amendment number three. I would vote against both of them. The one that I have leaned towards supporting, but I'm ultimately going to oppose is amendment number four, provide rights for victims of crime in the judicial process. I'll just read this to you as it is. Shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended so as to provide certain rights to victims against whom a crime has allegedly been perpetrated and allow victims to assert such rights? Sounds great. It's already the law. I have a philosophical objection to us amending the Constitution to do what the existing law can already do. The existing law in Georgia already does this. What this would seek to do is put the existing law into the Constitution. Now, there's a story behind this law. There is a multimillionaire who's been going around the country building up grassroots support for these laws because his family was a victim of crime. I believe his sister was killed by someone, if that's right, uh, who was let out of jail and she had no knowledge about it. It's a very sympathetic one. I would not shed a tear if this passed. But again, it's already state law. And philosophically, I really don't think we need to amend the Constitution to put laws into the Constitution that we can do without it. Because what if there is some unforeseen circumstance in this being put into the Constitution? You know, conservatives aren't always going to control Georgia courts. Eventually, you might get a liberal on there. And what will they do with the Victims' Rights Amendment into the Constitution that can't then be fixed by a future legislature without a two-thirds vote of both houses of the legislature and a vote of the people? I would much rather keep this in the law. The last one authorizes fair allocation of sales tax proceeds to county and city school districts. I understand why they want to do this. They want to make the the allocation, tax allocation better. Uh, But again, I don't want to amend the Constitution for this. Uh, They should have thought of different ways to do this. None of these need to be in the Constitution. There is no desperate need for any of these to be in the Constitution. They have failed to make the case for all of these. There is no major consensus or movement for any of these. The business community has a a grant. The farm community has a grant. You've got another one with outside money building grassroots support. I, I just, we don't need any of these amendments in the Constitution. We should not be in a rush to amend our Constitution ever. And I think that's what they're trying in this situation. I don't like that, although I'm not opposed to the Victims' Rights Amendment. I just don't think it's necessary, and I'm voting no on all of them.
95.5 AM 750 WSB. The phone number here, by the way, 404-872-0750-1800, WSB Talk. So Michael Avenatti, despite all the problems, last week, I don't know if you heard, so Michael Avenatti was ordered to pay something like $4 million uh, in a legal dispute, and then his law firm got evicted. Uh, The landlord that owned their building evicted them for failure to pay or some such. He still wants to run for president, though the Democrats are now actively throwing the guy under the bus. You guys know Michael Avenatti, right? The Stormy Daniels lawyer, he looks like a buddy of mine says he looks like scumbag Picard. (laughs) Picard from the Mirror Universe. Nonetheless, so he did a uh, profile in time with Molly Ball. Molly Ball, actually, in 2015... For the Atlantic wrote a big profile of me as a, the, the most influential conservative in America you've never heard of. Uh, and she's writing a profile of Avenatti now. What does that say about me? <laughs> she's moved to time, though. She also, uh, Molly Ball did the, the big profile of Stacey Abrams on the cover of Time uh, a while back. Uh, nonetheless, uh, so this is a quote from Michael Avenatti. Headed into the Me Too era Democratic primary. Quote, when you have a white male making the arguments... They carry more weight. And then he said he wished that wasn't so. But that the Democrats need to nominate a white male in 2020, and he wants to be that white male. (laughs) Do you really think that's going to fly? I mean, is is there anybody listening right now who is looking at the Democratic Party? Uh, Farticus, Kamala Harris, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and the like, and they think that that party really wants to go white male in 2020, really? There are going to be a lot of white men running, but do you really actually think they're going to be able to get anywhere? And this is bonkers, if you ask me. I mean, listen, I, I don't take Avenatti seriously. Uh, it, it's a, it's amazing to me that the Democrats have taken the guy seriously. And the only reason they've taken him seriously is because they view him as someone who has fought back against Donald Trump and scored points on Donald Trump because of Stormy Daniels. But he totally undermined the opposition to Brett Kavanaugh. He's not going to be able to escape that. He can go on as many redemption tours as he wants. But Democrats right now blame him. Blame him for undermining their opposition to Brett Kavanaugh. And I don't think that's going to change within the Democratic Party. I really don't. Um, They're going to go for Kamala Harris. There was a big profile of Kamala Harris the other day that that people in Iowa are in love with her because of how she fought in the Brett Kavanaugh hearing. That's the defining moment. That's why they were playing it up on the Judiciary Committee, she and Cory Booker. It's going to be a fight between her and Cory Booker, and she's going to win because Cory Booker, I don't know that he can throw a tough punch, and I think she can. Um, but, and you know, Bernie Sanders now, Democrats are saying he's too old, that they need someone young. I don't know that they know who they want, but it's going to be one of them. When we come back, let's shift gears. Uh, Megyn Kelly, NBC, and so much more. Welcome back. It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number 404-872-0750-1800-WSB-TALK. I know Megyn Kelly. Uh, you, you know, you go back to 2015 in my Red State event that we did in Atlanta and the president's comments about Megyn Kelly and her questions, and I didn't invite him to the event and all, and, and uh, Megan and I, we, we got to know each other, and we had known each other before then. People seem to think we didn't like each other because uh, uh, one moment on her show between her and me, we actually, were, we knew each other, I won't say great, but we got along well, and have gotten along since she went to NBC. I think she's a very nice person. I do not think uh, it was wise to try to defend blackface on TV, which, you know, I, I got to say, as an aside here, this preachy cultural appropriation nonsense from the left on Halloween, um, it, it, why is it always white liberals telling people you can't wear a Halloween costume because it might offend some minority? That, that seems to me that there's some paternalistic racism in there, that you're going to offend the American Indian or you're going to offend the, the Chinese or Japanese person by dressing up as the ninja or Mulan or what have you. Uh, and they get so upset about it, and you don't really find a lot of Japanese people getting upset about you dressing up as a ninja, or American Indians getting upset with you dressing up as Pocahontas. Um, and I think they're far more upset, Elizabeth Warren, for claiming to be Pocahontas. Nonetheless, 
I I I wouldn't have gone down the road Megan went down. But really, NBC is going to pay her $69 million, the rest of her contract, uh, to be rid of her. And it really has nothing to do with her comments, despite what people are saying. The reality is that there was a lot of resentment at the Today Show for bringing Megyn Kelly in from Fox for so much money. Uh, they would have preferred, I mean, but this is Matt Lauer, sexually harassing people for years, a predator on staff, and they were okay with Matt Lauer. They would rather have him than Megyn Kelly, and it has nothing to do with Megyn Kelly and everything to do with the fact that she came from Fox. I mean, what we're learning from NBC is behind the scenes, there was a staff revolt about Megyn Kelly. They did not want Megyn Kelly there. They have been looking for excuses to get rid of her, and they seized on this as the excuse to get rid of her because there can be no forgiveness for her ever working at Fox. That's what all of this is about. Uh, They didn't like that she came in with that much money. They didn't like that she got that show. And frankly, I don't think she was happy there either. There have been multiple reports that she much preferred to do hard news, that she wanted to do the soft news segments. She didn't like the soft news segments, and she wanted to do more. And she was in negotiations, actually, from what press reports say. She had a meeting coming up this week to talk about exiting that segment anyway and doing hard news segments. Well, now she's going to be out altogether, and it has everything to do with the staff at NBC not liking her. We had the situation at the New York Times as well. Remember that Slack chat? Someone screenshotted it, leaked the transcript of it, that you had staffers at the New York Times who were just appalled that the New York Times would dare to give fair treatment to conservatives, dare to actually cover conservatives fairly. Um, The intolerance of left-wing political activists in newsrooms is really driving greater distrust of the media. It really is, Uh, and I don't think this works long-term for the media. I certainly don't think it works long-term for the nation. We should be able to have a media that people respect, and we don't, and I can't blame anyone for not respecting them. Look at NBC's coverage of Brett Kavanaugh, how much they got wrong, how much they reported uh, that was proven not to be true. NBC in particular has been extremely egregious in the past few months of reporting left-wing talking points as fact and then having them disproved and shown that uh, they're not legit. I, 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 I wonder how long Andy Lack stays. Andy Lack is the well-paid president of the news group at NBC, and I can only imagine it's going to be a matter of time before Comcast shows him the door. Maybe they'll bring Jeff Zucker back to become the head of the news division, um, pull him out of CNN, where he renewed his contract, but reports are he's not happy that he hadn't been able to make the big dent as he wanted. Uh, who knows, but... Uh, you know, Megyn Kelly is essentially being rewarded for sixty nine with sixty nine million dollars to not work at NBC. That's the way I would look at it. Um, good for her for being able to cash out and get out of there. They clearly didn't want her, and now she's free of them. A buddy of mine texted me while we were checking traffic and points out, you know, Al Sharpton has been an employee at NBC for fifteen years, and they got Joy Reid, who's still having the FBI look into the, the terrible things she wrote on her, and they really weren't terrible. They were just terrible if you were progressive on her website. Um, but, and, you know, there's an interesting comparison here with Joy Reid and, and Megyn Kelly. Uh, they didn't like Megyn Kelly because she came from Fox and she never went through the bend over backwards, I'm now one of you, throw my old positions under the bus uh, thing that Joy Reid did. Now, Joy Reid doesn't necessarily have her show there anymore, but there hasn't been a movement to drive her out of the network despite the nonsensical uh, review of uh, of her statements and trying to file a complaint with the FBI claiming that someone hacked her website. It's all a bunch of hooey anyway, and everybody knew it was. You know, it's kind of ironic for me to have this conversation. I was on with Katie Turr on MSNBC earlier today talking about the election, the upcoming election. Um, I'll be on Meet the Press on Sunday on NBC, assuming they still have me on. I, I think they will. I've got great respect for some of the people at NBC, like Chuck Todd. Uh, even Joe Scarborough and I have been friends for a long time. We don't necessarily agree on everything. Uh, But he's a very nice guy. Uh, Very much have great respect for some of them. But NBC as a whole has been poisoned, it seems, by the progressivism at MSNBC. Rotating staff between the two, it hasn't worked well for them. And behind the scenes, some of their major figures at the network have been deeply critical of that. But they don't seem to be able to change it. And between them... I mean, you got Book Baldwin and Don Lemon at CNN referring to the mob as the M word, silencing Republicans for pointing out that there has been a mob. There is so much deserved distrust of the media in this country, and they seem completely oblivious to why people don't trust them.
So I am leaving here and headed up to Duluth. Uh, I rarely ever get up to Duluth. I, I, I know I've got a lot of li- listeners. Uh, a lot of you live up there. Uh, I'm going to the Atlanta Athletic Club to give a speech for the Family Policy Alliance tonight. Uh, and, you know, they're a good group that should be on your radar. One of the things that I have found in Georgia politics over the last number of years is we are really good at finding pro-business candidates to run for office and really bad at finding pro-family candidates to run for office and socially conservative candidates. you got a lot of people who claim to be socially conservative, but when push comes to shove, they don't want to support socially conservative legislation like RIFRA, for example, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or um, exceptions for um, foster care and faith-based adoption agencies and whatnot in Georgia. They, they don't want to stand up and fight for those things. Even though they say they love babies and they go to church and they love Jesus, they don't want to actually fight for any of this stuff to protect people of faith uh, under the law. And it's nice to have an organization in Georgia that actually recruits um, candidates who support family values. It, so I love Daredevil on Netflix. And at the beginning of season three, the, the Netflix, they haven't run from the religious aspect of Daredevil. Daredevil, I, don't, I, don't, I, I wasn't very familiar with him before the Netflix series. Watched and a buddy of mine, Ryan, gave me one of his comics and started reading uh, while I was in the hospital a couple of years ago. Uh, Daredevil, it's a great comic. And the, the character, Daredevil, is devoutly Catholic. And Netflix hasn't shied away from delving into theological issues in their TV series. It's very violent, by the way. You should know that. Not kid-friendly. I won't let my kids watch it. But one of the the Catholic priests this season, the character Daredevil is at war with God, so to speak. He's very angry with God and uh, keeps expecting God to do something grand and glorious to show him the way. And the priest says, you know, everybody wants the burning bush, but God usually shows up in a whisper. And I thought that was very profound. And it's true. And I see all the time people gravitate towards the burning bush candidates, the people who are loud and proud about their faith and kissing babies and loving Jesus. And those are the people who so often disappoint us when they actually get elected. They, the, the voters lack a level of discernment because they're being told what they want to hear. They hear it in the candidate. They elect the candidate, and then the candidate doesn't really fight for them. I would rather the the whispering candidate who really is uh, does share my values and really is someone who will go and fight for them. Uh, and that's uh, we've now got a, a group in Georgia who vets these candidates and finds those people who are committed to these issues that don't need to be flashy. They just want to go do the right thing. That's the Family Policy Alliance. So I'm happy to help them tonight up in Duluth, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a great night.